Hi, uh, we're here to talk about storytelling in, um, in deep tech. Um, and uh, my name is Ted. Uh, I'm a partner at Ikit Ventures based in, uh, in Stockholm. And with me here I have uh, Tony. Hi, I'm Tony Hökvist. And uh, as we speak right now, I'm head of design for Ainride. And um, just a few words about um, Ikit Ventures first. So Ikit Ventures is a, is a pan-European uh, VC. We're part of uh, EQT, which is a private equity group. So um, uh, we've been around for seven years now and invested in 90 or so companies. Uh, companies like Vault, which of course I have to bring up since we're in Finland, but also an emerging portfolio of, of deep tech companies like, uh, like Enride, uh, for instance. And, um, and Tony, who are, um, who are you? <laughs> I got a very nice presentation before here. Um, I mean, actually it's fun, both you and me, we started actually as uh, back in the days trying to figuring out what web was. I think we were, we were both competitors and, and, and uh, partners when we were, um, we were running different digital shops. Uh, that led, uh, led me to, to actually joining Airbnb, I think it's now seven years ago, or actually six years ago. I was there for like four and a half to five years. And when I came back from San Francisco, I joined Ainride. And uh, it's, it's extremely interesting to see a brand, especially in the face of, of startup to scale up. I joined Airbnb when Airbnb went from that startup culture to actually becoming a, a global super brand and, uh, and, and doing the, the scale up journey. And I feel that I joined Android at exactly the same time. So it's, 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 the, most, it's the most exciting times to be at, uh, at two brands that I think definitely will change and make, make a legacy. And instead of you using words to explain what Android is, we have, a, we have a video. So I'll hit next here and hopefully that video plays. So what was that? What did, what, what did we just see here? That was, a, that was a, a one of our pods. That was the that was the flatbed pod that we just launched. We just came back from uh, from the U.S. and we just had a, a huge launch. Actually, like moving over to the United States is like it's a given, especially if you are like a, a fry technology company. Uh, it's it's the epicenter of of transport and and fright and also a lot of the innovation stuff that is happening in the space. Um, it's, it's, it's the place that, uh, that we just need to be and where we just have to go there. So we just, we just came back from it, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and um, what, you're looking, uh, what you're looking at now is, is the, the, pod, the first pod in operation on a public road, and we also, the pod you saw right now, it was actually like an involvement of that into a more modular system. Actually starting to think about modularity in the transport system is a huge part. Um, and it's not just hardware, it's also, also software, right? Yeah, and I think this is the most important part that people don't think about, like disrupting, disrupting a problem as big as transport is, is not about trucks. I mean, everyone, I mean, most people and most people thinking about this industry, and you probably have met a few of them trying to raise money from you, they're approaching it from the, from the hardware perspective. They look, they look at the truck and they think the truck is the solution. Um, the truck is just a tiny, tiny part of the whole equation. I think if you, if you think about it like from a completely like fresh technology perspective, like, and, and artificial, like AI and intelligence in the system, like you can break it down into like, like the different load carriers or the different pallets, like how actually logistics looks today, like, and how, how that actually can be be first electrified, of course, but then automated in the long run. And, and to do all of that, you need to coordinate, you need UI, you need all the things that, that, that to, to run it and to, to control it. And, and this is Saga, so that is actually, Saga is, is our operating system and mobility platform uh, that's actually managing the whole system. So that was... And we're here to talk about storytelling in deep tech, and, and I think this is extra interesting because for, for some reason, uh, in deep tech, 
there is a lot of um, discussion and almost like an allergy against telling stories. Because I think it's, it has to do with not projecting or t talking about doing something that you're not doing. You're talking about snake oil and vaporware and, and being a salesperson in a deep tech startup in, in many cases is, is kind, of, kind of frowned upon. So there's like a thin line or, or a balance in between um, being someone like this and being someone like, like this. It's all about projecting your ambition of what you're trying to do into the future. And when you're projecting your ambition and talking about what you're doing in the future, of course you're talking that, about things that do not exist yet. And before this, we, we had a discussion about, uh, about narratives and about storytelling and centering the ambition of, of a company uh, around something that is so simple to, to understand, it almost, almost becomes banal. And we, we discussed JFK and, of, of course, and, and, the, um, and the space race, uh, starting in the 60s and in the, in the, in the 70s. And, and, and th this, I think, is a great example of a story that is so easy, so everyone can understand it. It's taking a human being and putting that human being on the, on the moon. And, and, and this narrative, of course, was a narrative about human beings, not a narrative about technical, technical specs. And, of course, this later gave birth to so, man, so much more than, uh, than, than just the, the rockets and the, the spacesuits and, and, and so forth. Mm, I, and mean, that's, I mean, main, mainly that's where our conversation, when we meet or having dinners or talk about the different companies you have invested in or the places I've been, this is one of the biggest mistakes I think people are doing. People are running after the tech. And I think that the, the whole point is that, the whole point is to actually like, like to, to paint to paint that, like, the child is imaginative, like, like, point of view about the Earth and humans and where we're going, and then actually, like, like believe in that so much. So, so all the other stuff just becomes add-on, I think is the key thing. I think it, if, you, if you take about, if you think about, um, we discussed, you, you visited me in San Francisco at the Airbnb, and Airbnb, like, if you break down the tech, it's, it's, a, it's a search engine. It's like it's indexing of, 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 of homes, alternative home accommodation search engine. Um, but I would, never, I, I would never have took that job. I would never have bought into the founder vision if it wasn't about something that was completely different. It was just like this, this simple idea that humans can find common ground, that actually the only way of, of finding that and acceptance is by traveling around the world and meeting people. And, and you can't do that in a closed environment like, like the, the industry that Airbnb disrupted because everything is commoditized. So you actually manage serendipity away from it. But when you opened up serendipity and you opened up the supply, actually belonging could flourish. And, and you can challenge that. And this is the, the other thing that I, that I love with big ideas is that you can, you can start talking about the best utility or the best search engine or how you're structuring your design above the fold and stuff. But in the end, the main thing that drives us and creates this, like, like, the, the, like the, the belief in, in the ambassadors, the followers, and you, when you're investing in companies, and, and me as like sitting and working with the product and the design, is to actually have a founder who, who really have that big thought. And, and it's so important. It's, it's just, it's the most important thing. And we discussed how, how perfectly um, the, the space race followed the, uh, the sort of narrative of the, uh, of, of the founder's journey or the, the monomus. Oh, yeah. And then we also discussed that a lot of startup journeys also follow this, this narrative. And when we discussed this, you mentioned that this was also a blueprint within Airbnb, for instance. And yeah. now, of course, of course, Android. Yeah. And I think, I think this is a lot of the stuff that we are seeing here is the new type of religion also, like the other metaphor you have here. And even if you look at the symbol of Airbnb and even Ainride, like they, it's, it's icons that is very minimalistic and actually are iconic. And also the, the followers, if you meet people who are following Airbnb as a brand, but also Ainride as a brand, they really want this idea to succeed. And this is something that is fantastic. It's not, and I'm not even talking about the people you're hiring or the investors. Actually, when you meet people and you're talking to people, they want your idea to succeed. And that's how, that value, accumulating that value is insane. 
Because that's why you have this insane valuation of companies. People don't measure things anymore in like rational numbers or like what type of IP. They, they, they measure it in that vision and how many people believe in it. And, and, that is, and that is also, I mean, you of course need to deliver. We know many people have gone out there and promised but never delivered. Um, but I think, it, I think it's fascinating. I think this is a really interesting topic because that's how you build those super brands that really people recognize and remember. So, so, so this was one narrative, very easy to understand, the, the space race. And right now, of course, there's a new narrative being formed, the narrative about the planet that we're on. Yeah. And, and uh, you mentioned that you, your perspective is that this is a narrative about man versus machine. Are we de we're debating about, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you also had this point of view about sustainability. I think it's broader than just the environment. We're all, we all, we all coming from a place where we actually really do care. And, but it's so big, so it's really hard to grasp it. And you have so many different points of views. I mean, if you're raising, if you're raising the conversation about environmental and sust like sustainability from an, an environmental perspective, like you get, you get a lot of, you get a lot of strong opinions. And, and I think, I think it's like, it's a given that we want to maintain the planet we're on. It's just a given, but it also comes down to the purpose. It's like, like, like what you just said, I think is so philosophical and we don't have any red wine here, so we should maybe not go there, but it's about like, 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 like what are we willing to sacrifice? in this obsession about the doing the technology revolution because we know it's coming like a train and, and when it's coming to, to the digitalization, electrification and automatization of the world, like what is the role for man? And I think, I think that is an extremely important topic that, that, that I would love more people focusing on today. Um, and uh, I also know that that's one of the reasons why, why you felt interested in Anorad from the first place. Uh, so what we see here, I think, is the, the, the remote driving capabilities of, of Enride. Uh, yeah. So, so in, in the world of autonomy, you're, it, it's, it's a lot about replacing human beings. But I think this is an interesting, interesting take. So what, what are we seeing here? So, so this, is, this is remote driving stations. And this is the whole idea about automatization shouldn't, shouldn't come with the price of drivers and humans. Uh, and, and like... I don't think anyone wants that future. I really, I, I really think that, like, of course, it's some type of jobs that, that robots can do. But, but, I also, but I also think when you're thinking about it in the big society of thing, actually, I think it is a step here where actually it's like super important to think about the, the human aspect of it. And, and the interesting thing, I think, if you look at it from, from a remote driving perspective, is that then sustainability not only becomes electrification and environmental and, and CO2, it's actually also become like, like rights as like, like jobs and employer rights and democratization of, of your own hours. So, so like, our, our role in, in, yeah. in it, yeah. I mean, many of the jobs that the industrial age created are not jobs that we are, as a society, proud of. Like, we wouldn't recommend them for our kids, so why would we recommend them for anyone else? And why do we use that as an excuse to say, like, I don't want that job, but maybe someone else, where they are in the social spectrum, like, they should take this job. So I think, I think back to the whole idea about, like, I want to I wanna drive that. You drove that. I remember I did, I did, you, I did drive it. You, you, you visited us in Gothenburg, and you were driving around. And, and I want to do that. I don't, I don't necessarily want to be a truck driver, but even, like... Even my son, he, he looks at that and he was like, I, like he's a video gamer, he, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. So that is, that I, is the... I, I love this picture, by the way. It's, oh, where did you find this it's, one? It's, it's, it's one of the first schematic drawings of how, how the pod works. You see the cameras and the light. I, 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 I met our founding engineer, Thomas, in the audience, and maybe he's drawing it. I didn't even know where it's come from. But you have the, you have the remote driving station in the corner there. And to the left, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the guy lying down very yeah, yeah, yeah. comfortably. It's not that complicated. Do you when, see? When, when you, don't, you, don't need, you need to go to the big schools, to, to MIT, to figuring out that. Here's another sketch. What is, what is this? Oh, that's, that's the first version. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah. I, I blame that on, on our founders. It's actually, it's, uh, 
and, and, but I think this is important. It's fun when you show this, because one of the things that I can take credit for, but the founders, and uh, both um, Robert Linnea and Philip very early did, they, they, made, they made imagination real. And I know that, because you and me talked a lot about Einride. They went from an idea to a visualization of that imagination fast. Like, people were like, that can't be done. And then in front of them, it was. And then people said, like, you can't, like, you, you can fill it up with crisps or, t like, maximum, like, because you can't. And then they put it and they filled it up with real goods. And it's like, you can't drive it on public road. And they did. And it's like the same story over and over again. It's like these big narratives, when you're fulfilling that promise over and over again, uh, that's when you're building that trust. And it's interesting you're talking about narratives because I think many people talked, I saw a speech before here where people talk about the value of brands. I think brand is just the current, like brand is just the currency of trust. That's what it is. We don't, think, we don't talk about brand as a separate thing. You can't just put a TV commercial on or an event and say, now we're building brand. Like brand is about having a big narrative, building towards that narrative, and over and over again, like fulfilling the promises and, and challenging all the people that have the right to be skeptical, because we are skeptical. I, like first time I heard about Einride, I was the most skeptical person. I like, I Googled everything. I was like, that's not true. And then when I started to dig deeper and deeper, I was like, this is actually happening. It's happening right now. I think what is, what is kind of interesting looking at this, this pod, I think this is the, the new version of the, of the pod that is rolling out right now. So it's, it's as if it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very clear manifestation of the future. If I'm, I'm showing this picture to my, to, my, to my dad, he instantly understands yeah. that this is the future of, future of trucking. I think we have another picture here from... Uh, from a Donald Duck comic where, where the Android pod is featured. And, and, and to, the, to the right here is from, I think it's a senator campaign in, in the US where, where it's featured. When, when something kind of becomes embedded into the, the fabric of culture, it's, it's very easy to grasp just by seeing sort of the design of this, uh, of this vehicle. It's slightly different from an archetype. It feels, it feels like something that is like a robot, but it also feels like a truck. I talked, with, I talked with one of the uh, first designers, Daniel is his name, that actually drew and made some of the first, especially this version you're seeing here, but also the conversation about last one. And, and, and we had a long conversation about it being actually an, like, an, uh, like, like think about it as a, like a construction, like something that's reflecting in the surrounding. Uh, it's like architecture, actually. It's a, it's, like, it's a thing that moves around that is like architecture that actually is like, is, is very, even though it's sustainable, it still has that glossy, like, feeling because it's so important that it's actually melting into the surrounding because it's part of the community. It's not, it's not just logistic and utility. And I think that's, from day one, design has been such a oh, driving force for Enride. And I think that's what the key is. What I think is interesting is, I mean, both of us worked with, with branding and marketing in the traditional world. And in the traditional world where there's no real differentiation in between products, yeah. if you take cars before Tesla, basically, every premium sedan was basically the same. The only thing that, that, that sort of differed was the exterior design and, and, the, um, and the brand. And, and because of that, you, you charge the brand and the product with a lot of different values. You're, you're doing collaborations with artists and musicians and stuff like that. But, but within tech, where there is real differentiation between products, it's as if the marketing historically has been almost sort of completely complete opposite. You, you really want to belong yeah. to, the, to the category uh, or to a category because you don't want to be seen as something too new because there's someone who wants to, has to buy the product in the on the other side of, of the table. But th that's, I think, why, why there are so clear trends, where every startup, like I know two years ago, looked like, branding looked like Stripe, and now everything looks like Pitch. You have the 3D animated characters and the... I mean, and it's the, it's the, the, the herd mentality. But the other thing is this, we, we discussed about, do actually any disruptor, has, this, has anyone in their own circle or category disrupted their own category? Like, do we know about anyone? Because most people, like most founders and most disruptive companies are actually coming from a completely different industry. Like, the founders of Airbnb were designers. Like, they, they, they had no, nothing to do with hospitality. 
So I think I think that like just inventing your own categories, I, I can't I can't come up with is any other solution. But but I think another perspective is that it's 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 if the if the product if, is differentiated, the, the the branding and the wrapping and the design yeah. might might be very much the same as something that already exists. I mean, first it was because you intercom. Wanna... Everything looked at intercom with a sort of scri scribbly because you want to fit and then Dropbox you, you... and then Stripe and now you pitch. You think it's because you they want like because brands want to fit in. I think it's because you're you're a bit afraid. I mean, the, the product in itself is different, but you can kind of want the buyer to look at the product or and hang it on a mental hook of something. Oh yeah, yeah. Mean. You want yeah the perceived idea to be. Yeah, back to the archetype. Exists. But, but with, with Android, it's, I mean, they're clearly the founders and, and, and now you dared to make the product look different from, from the beginning. And, and, and from my perspective, when I, as an investor looking from the outside in, in the beginning, I was a bit skeptical because, because it, it, it felt like, ah, a cool, a cool rendering. Uh, but then when you realize that it's not just a rendering, it's actually, it's actually real. That's kind of when, when, when the, whole, the whole thing started. Um, started happening. So how, how, how have you been thinking? I mean, th th this is a slide from, from, uh, from your recent rebranding. Re yeah. re no, but I, I, th I think it's, I mean, one thing, one thing is maybe the consumer approach to things, that it's not a transport brand. It's like if you, if you think about transport and you think about cheap shipping and, and carriers, you're ending up in a business to business area. Uh, and and I, I know the founders says from day one, being extremely focused on end consumers. And it sounds so weird, it's like, why, why, would, like, why wouldn't Ainride focusing mainly on, on shippers? Of course, of course like, like that's where a lot of the business is starting. But when you think about the big idea of actually disrupting like, like transport and, and delivering and shipping and all the stuff, it starts with end consumer. Like a lot of the behavior starts with end consumers. So if you think about this, it looks very inspired by UI and, and also, uh, also the simplicity and utility, even though it has a strong brand element and iconic. To give you one example, we, I was in a conversation with the founders the other day about checkouts. Like you can't even, today you, you can, you can, you can, if you go to like Klarna Checkout or, or Shopify, you, you can't even, you can choose like diesel tomorrow or diesel in two weeks. Like you can't even choose, is no electric option. And people don't even know, people think that maybe, like most people you ask, they think shipping is fantastic. It's like they order something is just showing up. They have no idea the impact and the footprint they're doing by, by buying four sneakers and sending three back. They have no idea. Because at the, at the, at, at the, use, at the user layer, that behavior and that, that, that like, to make that type of, of decision as a consumer and demand stuff as a consumer, we as brand needs to inform, but we haven't. We don't inform, we hide. Because we don't want them to know. We want them to believe that they're doing a good act by recycling or whatever, by shipping it to another country. But, but that's not how it is. So I think, I think it starts by having that a consumer approach to it. But actually, like, like everything is melting together. You can't have a big idea and think about yourself as a business-to-business -business brand. Or, uh, yeah. I think it starts there, and I think that has been the philosophy when we design everything. Even if you're going to make a, a, a food order or you're going to make an extremely complex logistic order, why can't the UI like, and the experience and the messaging and the language you're using be as simple? Mm. Why? I like, why can't you best borrow from the best mm. like consumer brands, mm. even though you are a business-to-business -business brand? So, so consumer mindset, even if you're a business to business. We have one minute left. Should we, should we uh, try, to, try to summarize this somehow? H how should one think when, when, uh, when crafting stories for, for deep, te deep tech companies or things that does not exist yet? You're asking me? You're asking, I'm asking you, or should I? <laughs> uh, you have. You, I mean, you have a lot of answers to this as well. No, but, I mean, but, 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 but from my perspective, we, we actually have... Let, let's do this super quickly. We, we, have, we have four... Uh, four, four tips or four, four kind of leave behinds. So I think the, the, the first one here is, um, let's see if I can get it here. So dare to tell a story. So dare to dramatize the, the ambition. Yeah. Sort of really project the future out there. And that's what I think you guys have, have done with the, the bold design of the, of the actual product. And then keeping it very simple uh, without losing the mystery. And in a lot of cases when it's too simple, it's... Uh, it's, it becomes bland, like you're providing transport solutions, yeah. who, who cares? Um, third one, make it visual. 
Um, Hugely important. Be like I'm a smart five-year-old. This is a mostly important. This is the most important thing. Don't underestimate visualization of ideas. Don't don't. Yeah. And and the, and and the, the fourth one. What I also like about you when you when you just look at the um, the uh, the pod, it's like ah, oh, it's hardware. But there's also it's like it's like kind of like a software chapter two to it. Yeah. So that's that's an attempt at least. Nice summary, Ted. So with that. Uh, there is a blinking circle saying we have zero seconds left to this uh, to this talk. So I guess that's uh, that's a cue for us to stand up and leave leave the stage. So big big thank you. Thank you.